Life's a daring, bold adventure, or it's nothing at all. All right, what's good, everybody? It's your boy, Chris Crawley, Desire for Iron Fitness. Today, I have a special guest, a gentleman I've been following for a while. Got a lot of great information uh, just on his TikTok channel, let alone uh, some of the other stuff he puts out. Great dude, natural bodybuilder, Tom Kiat. Tom, the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself. Hey, good stuff, guys. Great being on the show. I love what you're doing, Chris, and uh, spreading the world about natural. The word about natural bodybuilding is huge. Uh, not enough of us do it. So the fact that you're providing this voice is really cool. I know you had uh, my buddy Philip Ricardo on the show. Yeah, uh, he's always a pleasure. Class act. Uh, it's guys like you. It's guys like Philip that are going to spread the word. Um, what can I say? I'm 52 years old. I feel like I'm 35. Uh, lifetime natural bodybuilder. I've never dabbled in any, any kind of testosterone or anything like that. I'm probably as natural as it can be. I'm on the smaller side, um, physique wise, 510, probably right now, 187. I usually compete at about 177. I'm known for my consistency. I'm known for my precision in training. Uh, that's what people know me for just dialing in properly. Um, what can I say, man? I've been competing for a long time in the Canadian circle as well as the pro natural circle. I did the Jordan Cup uh, years ago. Uh, good experience there. I'm WNBF qualified uh, as well as a few other organizations, but um, decided to back off of bodybuilding for a little bit. And I know we're going to talk about it later on because of the drug scene. We talk about natural bodybuilding. The fact is that when you carry that natural title as your banner, you need to adhere to it. But we know that that's not the case and people find loopholes and natural competitions aren't so natural. Right. Um, so hence the reason why I took a back seat, moved to Costa Rica, living the life of my dreams here, uh, retired, but still coaching a few people to keep busy because there's only so much margarita you can drink on the beach. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, just living the dream here in Costa Rica with my wife, four dogs, and uh, things are great, man. Outstanding. Well, you talked about, well, let's go right into, um, you know, we're both in our late 20s. I like to refer to it. Okay. I'm, I'm 48. <laughs> right. uh, you're 52. Um, when I, you know, you've seen some of the stuff. And for those who don't know, um, I'm very new to the whole bodybuilding scene. In fact, for many, many years, I was the furthest thing from a bodybuilder. I looked more like Grimace than I looked like, you know, say, he, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. But when I started going into the whole idea of getting into bodybuilding, um, I don't want to, I don't, if somebody wants to use gear, that's between them and God. I'm not really too worried about that. But as for me, <laughs> since I already had health problems. I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all that stuff. And also the job I do, if I got caught doing gear, I'd lose my job. And I just, right. You know, that wasn't even an idea. Um, but now we have so many men in our age group that when they're starting to endeavor to get fit, the first thing they're looking for um, is, well, you know, maybe I need to get on TRT. Maybe I got to do this. It's such a damn quick fit society that we live in, especially um, in the Western Hemisphere where, look, you and I are talking to each other thousands of miles away on the Internet. So we have that quick fix type of idea. Um, what is your advice to those guys to like, perhaps not go down that TRT route yet. Okay. So like you said, TRT is very easy to get on. Mm -hmm. uh, I have this guy hounding me in Costa Rica to say, you need to try it. We also have some GH. It's a clinic in San Jose, the largest city here. And he said, it's done wonders for me. It's going to do wonders for you. Uh, and it's not overly expensive here. Now I know you can get a doctor administered anywhere in the world. Having said that, it is to me a quick uh, fix. There are some consequences to it. I think there's a lot of benefits to it. But something like TRT, unless you exhaust all other avenues first, right. I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about precision with your diet. I'm talking about precision with eating good, healthy foods, getting your protein totals right, getting your calories right, training properly, recovering properly, using modern day recovery techniques, training smart, using your brain. And once you do that across the board, you get your sleep, you're feeling good. Um, once you do that across the board and you've maximized your progress and you wanna go further, 
then make that choice. But until you do that, I think you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice. Now, I'll ask you straight up, Chris, I might put you on the spot here because I ask people when I say, how serious are you? How many calories do you eat on average per day? How many grams of protein do you eat per day? And I've got guys who are in the NFL that I coach and they come to me saying, what do you think of this IGF factor of this? What do you think of the steroid? Should I take it? And the first question is, how many calories are you on? What's your protein total? And they have no idea. And the moment you fix that and they start making progress again, and now they're injury free and they're gaining their lean muscle mass, it's kind of like, shit, I should have explored that first. But you ask anybody, and most people don't know how many calories they consume in a day. They don't know how many grams of protein, nor are they consistent with it. So exhaust that avenue first. Amen. Perfect. Yeah, as you know, it, I get that all the time, too, at my gym. You know, I was like, oh, man, how can we not doing this? How can we not doing that? I'm like, I don't feel the need to. Uh, my my personal opinion is, uh, you know, 48 years old, um, I'm definitely eating my steak. I'm eating my eggs and all that other stuff. Uh, I would consider the TRT stuff if I was having performance issues outside of the gym. The gym right. for me is a place where I'm, you know, I'm putting on the muscle and everything else. And whatever I'm able to do naturally is what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? And, you know, you're discussing the natural bodybuilding organizations and the competitors being about as natural as, um, you know, say Chris Bumstead, who, by the way, I think is the GOAT, but he doesn't even try to say he's right. a man, right? Right. Right. Um, what are see i'm still very new to the whole thing i've competed maybe uh for the past three years but i <laughs> see some of the people i've competed with that make me look like a string bean and i'm like if that guy's natural then i'm the pope um what kind of things have you run into in that regard okay yeah so um competing in the jordan cup in 2012 so jordan cup was the premier event at the time it's arguable that maybe the wmbf worlds might have been but the jordan cup was pretty prestigious and uh, there were, I think, 27 men in the category. It was uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I was a middleweight at the time. In my class was uh, Philip Ricardo. We had Cleveland Thomas, who won it all. Eric Allstrop, um, Paulia Tomasi, a whole bunch of other guys in my weight class. Uh, having said that, I'm talking to Eric backstage, fellow Canadian. And Eric gives me the lecture. He goes, Tom you look great. He says, you really look great. But what I do know about you is you are so far on the left of the spectrum, natural wise, you are so natural that you're kind of shortchanging yourself competition wise, because if you look at the spectrum, you got one side over here, one side over here. Most of the guys are at least in the middle. And I'm kind of like, Eric, that's not the way it's supposed to be. This is a natural competition. Uh, I, other than protein powder, I don't take anything. That's what it is. And he says, well, and then you're shortchanging yourself because there's a lot of guys here who are on gear and, you know, whether a, a great degree or middle of the road, mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, that's not cool. Right. That's not cool at all. And when you saw some of these guys backstage, you see a competitor who takes off his clothes and he's already jacked. He's already pumped up. He did not pump up before the competition. He just went on stage he did maybe three bicep curls with the uh, exercise bands. I'm like, dude's on to something. And I saw the pills he was taking beforehand, right. right before he went on stage. This is not right. This is not cool. And although I did great, I placed fourth. So we had um, Cleveland number one, Philip number two, Eric number three, me number four. Uh, two of them went on to take stuff. Two of them went on to become IFBB pros. I think uh, Philip was the only guy who stayed natural out of that group. I don't think I would have beaten them regardless, but I know for sure I was clean. And I'm, I know for sure two of them weren't. Right. Yeah, it, it seems such a shame. You know, I mean, <sighs> when, you, when you're in high school and you cheat on a test, that might be one thing. But, you right. know, not that that's okay. But, I mean, let's be honest. You know, no, no one's perfect. No one's a saint here, right? Uh, but when you're getting into something like a natural bodybuilding show even if you win the top prize it's probably not even nearly as much money as you would have spent on gear to begin with right and when you get to see your your fancy trophies behind you and you're going to sleep at night and recognize yeah i got that first place trophy but i didn't really win it it's almost like deflating footballs and winning the super bowl anyway you know what i mean 
Right. But Chris, everyone's using it. That's the logic. Everyone's using it. So, hey, I didn't get caught. The trophy's legit. When in fact, there are guys like me who don't. And I'm, it's not a level playing field. Yeah, that's just, uh, I, I just, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. But again, it is, it's the world we live in. So I, I, I understand that, I guess. Um, so I found you a little bit ago because I was uh, getting out of my own head. I was one of these guys that thought it had to be volume. It had to be volume. It had to be volume when it came to my training. Right. Uh, my own coach, uh, you know, was telling me, Chris, you're overtraining. You're sitting there training six days a week, hitting every body part twice a week, and you're doing like 15 to 20 sets per, you know, thing. And then, you know, yeah. uh you try not to say that, you know, perhaps um, my idol Arnold could be possibly wrong. And then hearing about this guy, Mike Menser, and of course, Dorian Yates, I came across your channel and you're talking about the one set to failure. Um, I think a lot of people are mis not, I don't want to say they're misunderstanding, but they're making it sound like you just say, you just do one set and that's it. And that's, they're obviously not listening to everything you're saying. Um, Could you please give the people, the people here that what you're talking about when it comes to high intensity training? Okay. Uh, first off, I do want to say this. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. When when were your best gains? I want to say that um, pretty much these past couple uh, months now that I, well, this past year, since I finally decided to hit each body part just once per week, as opposed to twice per week, Got give it. myself a little bit more rest. And now that I have been employing these high intensity techniques, I'd like to say that I'm seeing some gains, but I'm also in my gain phase right now. And uh, right. during the holidays and when I was in Louisiana, uh, staying in a hotel, maybe I wasn't eating as good as I should have. So some of these gains are uh, a little bit around the belly than they more should be. Got it. I feel like I'm getting stronger, a lot stronger now. Good, good. Yeah, here's my take on it. Uh, I'll challenge anybody. I'll debate anybody. And people will say, well, I don't believe in high intensity. I believe in high volume or vice versa. I always ask them this, show me the proof. Show me what you're doing. Show me your logbook. Show me your tape measure. Show me your body fat pinches. Show me your scale weight. Uh, Show me how you're doing with your results because results don't lie. Uh, My biggest gains ever were when I first started, just as it is for 95% of the population, other than those guys taking gear. Right. I went from 155 pounds to 175 in my first year as a 16 year old to 17. What was I doing? Three sets of 10, because that was the prescribed plan. That's what everybody did is three sets of 10. You did a few sets here and there. You did your bicep curls, tricep extensions, bench press rows, maybe squats, maybe some hamstring curls. And that was it. Right. And then it was the second year I went from 175 to 190. Huge gains. Right. Again, three sets of 10. First set was kind of a warm up. Second set, you kind of gave it something. And third set, you went all out. And that was it. It was low volume. Right. It was low volume. And then all of a sudden, you look at the bodybuilding magazines. Started reading them. And they said, well, if you want to make progress, Gary Stridham was popular at the time. Lee Haney, do your six days a week, two hours a day. Well, that's what I'm doing then. I, I want the results. At that point, I go into university and we're doing six days a week, two hours a day. And the only reason why we took Sunday off was because the university was closed and that's where I trained. And I went from 190 to 195 and I hit a wall. And at that point, you're trying to smash through the wall. You're trying to make the gains. You're doing everything possible. You notice the knee pain. You notice the elbow pains. You notice there was no progress at all. And you're like, what's going on here? This is not working. And it was only when you took a two week layoff because the university was shut down for reading week or Christmas that you come back and you're stronger. And I scratched my head and I talked to my workout partners like, what's the deal here? Why are we stronger coming back? I don't know. Let's just run with it. And then the same thing happens the next holiday. We come back stronger and we never really clued in. But we did know that we were working hard with very little gains. But hey, that's what the prescribed plan is. That's what we're going to do until we ran into Mike Menser, Mike Menser's book. And Mike Menser talked about this low volume stuff. And we only got introduced to Mike Menser through Dorian Yates's photos. One year, he goes from huge to super huge. Okay, what is he doing? I know what he was doing. He introduced growth hormone into his plan. Sure. And he looked phenomenal. But nonetheless, he wasn't doing a lot of volume. 
So I went out and contact Mike um, Dorian Yates. I wrote him a letter. We didn't have emails back then. We didn't have texts. I actually wrote him a letter. I didn't expect any return back. I said, hey, Dorian, this is Tom from Canada. Just writing to you. What do you think of this high intensity? I know you're big on it. What do you think of Mike Menser? What do you think of all this? We left it at that. A letter comes back from Dorian to my house, from Temple Gym to my house. I can't believe dude wrote to me. Right. And it was like handwritten blue ink. And he said, this works. You're going to learn more from Mike Menser than anything in body, the bullshit you read in bodybuilding magazines. That's what he said. He says, I highly recommend you try it and see for yourself how it works. And kind of left it at that. Like, I can't believe Dorian Yates wrote this letter to me. This is so cool. What a class act. We later saw him in Toronto at a workshop and he confirmed a lot of the things. People said like, how much do you do on the bench press? He says, I don't do a, a one rep max. It makes no sense. This is not about ego training. This is about training the muscles. I'm like, okay, another check mark for Dorian. How many sets of bicep curls do you do? He said, I do a warm up and I do my one set till failure. And that's it. How about calf raises? Same kind of thing. Now the principle was, one set per exercise, not necessarily one set per body part. We decided, we mean my workout partner and I said, we're going to do this. We're going to go from two hours to 15 minute workouts. Chris, the results were through the roof. And at that point, I went from 200 pounds to 215. I went from a bench press of 315, a uh, single bench press, 315 flat bench to 315 on an incline for eight reps. That's a significant difference. Military press, 185 for about five reps to 275 seated military press, right all the way down, all the way up, 275 for five reps. My strength went through the roof. My size went through the roof. And I'm like, okay, there's something here. This is real. And at that point, we adopted from there on in. And every single time I competed, that was the principle. It was three times a week, broke down the training, I let my body rest and it worked and I had numbers to back it up. Dorian was very big at writing down his result, uh, results and making it very scientific. I did the same thing. So I swore by it. And then Chris, the switch was there was one point in time in 2017, maybe somebody said, you don't overtrain, you're just under eating. Okay. So I went back to high volume. I was eating ah. like, 8,000 calories on a Saturday with my refuel, like four or 5,000 calories on a Wednesday. Everything else was pretty even. And I, I noticed I was eating more, but no progress. Sure. And I was wearing down big time. I was shredded, but tons of pain in my joints. I went back to high intensity training and the results were amazing. So what do you say to somebody who says that high intensity doesn't work? Try it for yourself. Right. Yeah, you're not gonna necessarily you're not gonna lose anything if you try something for 12 weeks. That's just that's a very short time. No, what you're gonna allow is your body to recover and actually heal up a little bit. And you're gonna have a life outside of the gym. That's another thing. <laughs> um gosh darn. You know, starting out the program, I mean, again, my my children are grown. Um, I'm thinking, I mean, I had my kids pretty young, but that's the one thing a lot of us don't have six, seven hours a day to work out all the time. So oh. it's like you know, yeah, we could be that part of that 4 a.m. crew, which I am. I still get up real early so that way I can get it all done before my work day is concerned. But one of the biggest benefits done in like 30 minutes, if not sooner. Um, something that you said that just really rang a bell or put a light bulb on for me. You said it's not like one set per body part. It's one set per exercise. Um, that's something that I've been kind of trying to figure out. So I'll pick your brain real quick. Say, for example, chest. Right now, my workout consists of I'm hitting butterfly, and then I'm supersetting with uh, like an incline machine press, and then the cable crossover. So that way I can try to hit every head. Let, go through like just one of your workouts real quick and how your, maybe your chest, shoulders, whatever particular body part you want to talk about. Okay, so I'll give an example of uh, what had worked. Uh, I'm I'm a gym rat by heart. We had every single piece of equipment in my 900 square foot basement gym when I was in Canada. Everything you could manage. I had I had three cages. I had pec decks, rear delt machines, leg extensions, everything you could think of. Um, what worked best for me for chest was this. I uh, did a pec tech, uh, a, a chest fly, because I knew that if I didn't do that, 
my weakest link for the bench press was going to be my triceps. And you're only as strong as your weakest link. So I knew, hey, I'm doing my bench press. My triceps are going to fatigue before my chest does. And my chest is never going to fully grow. So that's where I did the chest fly first. I would do a warm up and I'd go as heavy as possible for about eight to 12 reps. Great form, full range of motion until failure. And then I'd try to go just a little bit above and beyond. I'd do a forced rep. Somebody would spot me or I would just rest for five seconds, squeeze out another rep, try to hold it, bring it back. At that point, I would go on to a chest press, whether it was free weight or a machine. In this case, I kind of like the machine, to be honest with you. And, and I would do, again, eight to 10 reps after about a two, three minute um, um, rest period. I would do a set of chest until failure. I'd rack it, count to about five seconds and try another rep, rack it, wait another five seconds and try another rep. And then I'd back off. I was done. That was it. But the effect of my chest, the way it felt after the fly and the way it felt after my uh, bench press, I felt like that's all I needed. Anything more was overkill. Now, that, at that point, you start looking at your numbers, right? And I started looking at my weightlifting partner's numbers at the time, like we're progressing. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. If this is working, we're not going to touch this. It's just two sets. Why add a third when we don't need to? And the numbers kept progressing. I'm not going to say exponentially, but dramatically, incrementally. And it worked. So that's my chest routine. Chest fly and a bench press. That's it. Here's what happens, Chris. When you say you've got 10 sets of chest, you're not going to go all out set number two, th set number three, set number four, because you need your set to save yourself for later on. Right. But when you say I'm going all out, which is the rep that's going to give you the biggest progress? Rep one or 10? The answer is rep number 12. It's not rep number 10, because that's what your body's capable of. You got to bring it above and beyond for growth to happen. Everybody knows that. Right. So, well, now... Um... You, you were mentioning there was a uh, a study um, on someone else in the science area talking about failure. <laughs> right. And uh, he's a good guy. I don't want to mention his name per se because I don't want to call him out like he's doing something wrong. But his uh, quote was, that's my failure. Okay. Yep. And yep. it's like, well, no. I mean, what kind of like mindset do you need to put yourself in to get to that point where, I mean, you have the experience more so. Failure to you, what exactly is that? Right. Okay. In all fairness, Chris, your audience is going to listen to this. And I'll say, it because I know you don't want to, is Brad Schoenfeld. And Brad's, Brad Schoenfeld is a very intellectual guy. He's a cool guy, former natural bodybuilder. Um, he was on a episode with John Meadows, a guy who's on gear, who I respect that I like John Meadows, the fountain of information. And they were both training until failure. So just for your audience who hasn't seen the video, they can look it up. They can easily find it. Just type in John Meadows, Brad Schoenfeld, failure. It'll pop up. Um, I think John expected Brad to go a little bit further. Right. And I'm watching this and I heard that's my failure. I'm like, dude, you had another four reps in you. And unless you watch the video and see his failure and say that I'm saying you, need, you needed to do another three or four, you're capable of three or four more. So if he bases his entire studies around his perception of failure, he's done all of his studies injustice, period. Right. So I've got to see, I want to look at every single study and I want to say, show me your definition of failure because that's not it. Sure. My definition of failure is this. You uh, try to do the rep and uh, there's a point in time where you've got this momentary failure and you must proceed above and beyond that. And if you can't and you end up holding it halfway through for about five seconds in a contracted position and then you bring it down, that's momentary failure. You're done. Thank you. That's I've been trying to figure that out. I, I think I'm on that same track because I'm like, people say momentary failure. And I'm like, oh, I really can't get it. I really can't get it. And then I put it back and I'm always worried. Right thinking to myself, could I have gotten that extra rep? You know what I mean? Yes. I think yeah. that's, uh, you're putting the nail on the head, the rest, pause things, all these different things, folks. Um, you're saving so much time. You yes. Know? 
Yes, you could do volume. Yes, you could do high intensity. You can't do both. So with only 24 hours in a day, do the math, folks. I mean, there's life outside of the gym as much as I wish there wasn't, you know. <laughs> but so yeah, yeah, big time, big time. Yeah. You so along some of the other things that you do, um, you mentioned you you're in, you did you do like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and some other um hobbies as well, right? Right. Yeah. So. The uh, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a is a nightmare. It's a disaster. All right. It is one thing I think people truly need to try. 90% of people quit it. Uh, it is extremely tough. It's uh, you, you learn humility. Mm -hmm. I'm an athletic guy. I went in there and um, me as a, as an early practitioner against somebody off the street, I will destroy them. Sure. I will destroy them. Me against any of the guys in my club, they're very kind to me. I will tap out in probably 15 to 30 seconds. Right. And, it, and it's, it's quite um, humbling. Having said that the injuries, the pains that you get from that, if you think you're going to be able to do a sport like that and bodybuilding, you got another thing coming. You got to work around those injuries. So yeah, jujitsu is fun, but it's, it's put a cramp in my training, Chris. Gotcha. I haven't uh, rolled in years. I, I did back in Tucson and I moved up here and I just haven't really been able to get back into it. It's one of those, like, maybe I could, but kind of, like you know what I'm talking about then? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My, <laughs> my left shoulder still gives me problems from my ego, not tapping out when I really should have a long, yes. long time ago. And yeah, it's big time. you know, uh, they usually say there's about 10,000 taps between belts. So perhaps, you know, that's crazy. You know, yeah, you, you go at the door and, and tap when you need to, you know. So moving from uh, Canada to Costa Rica, I can't imagine anything had to do with the weather, uh, you know, differences. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. What brought you out that way? All right. We um, my wife and I went to Hawaii for honeymoon and we loved it. So our hearts were in Hawaii. OK. All right. Our hearts were in Hawaii. We love it. We went to Maui. We went to uh, Oahu as well. And we just absolutely loved it. We said we are going to find a way to move to Hawaii. Um, my wife's a registered massage therapist. She got in with one of the hotels, um, major chain as a registered therapist. I try to get in as a school teacher because that's my background. And I had heard they're hiring from abroad and they weren't. So I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. We're not going to be able to do this. So we got to find an alternative. I went back to work. I figured, okay, I guess that's it. Then my dream is done, but we'll figure this out somehow. Um, by chance, I went to this kind of like a men's group networking meeting where just people shared stuff about business. And I went to it. A guy says, I'm thinking about moving to Costa Rica in 2024. I'm like, hmm, Costa Rica. I thought Costa Rica was Puerto Rico. I had no idea. I thought it was an island. And um, my wife was having coffee in a nearby vicinity. She picks me up. We, we travel together. And I said, we're moving to Costa Rica. And she says, all right, let's do it. We got home. Chris, we researched for three days straight. I didn't sleep for three days straight. We looked at every single property we could in Costa Rica. This was during COVID. Okay. Like, this is right before COVID, March 2020. Sure. And I said to my wife, I bought a, a two tickets to Costa Rica for five days during the March break. We're shopping. We're buying a house. And that was it. Life's a daring, bold adventure or it's nothing at all. We're doing this. We ended up coming here. We were not going to leave without buying a house. Pierre, uh, sorry, um, Justin Trudeau was saying, you need to come back. Screw that, buddy. I'm not coming back until I get a house. I'll come back when I decide. You're not telling me when I'm coming back. We're buying a place. We're moving to Costa Rica. That's it. And the rest is history, man. We came back. We sold our house. I sold three cars. I sold a motorcycle. I sold all of my gym equipment, sold a business, retired, retired my wife. And we couldn't fly to Costa Rica because there were no airlines flying. We ended up uh, summoning a, par a private jet flying our Great Dane and two other dogs in this private jet and we figured out a way they opened up the airport for one plane nice. they hired workers they called back workers for one plane and we ended up in costa rica in august of that year because we were going to do it nice. again if i can share a message to uh your listeners life's a daring bold adventure or, or nothing at all you don't want a life of regrets 
live life to the fullest. It was the best decision I've ever made. And when you get something in your mind and your heart and you're not doing it, you need to reevaluate and just say, I'm going to have the courage to do this and at least take that chance. Thank you. That that's I'm going to, that's going to be emblazoned in some shorts and an Instagram channel and everything. Um, Good. So that's one thing I, uh, from my current job, I can retire in two years. I'll be 50 and I want to, my biggest plan is to share my passion for, for men around our age group to get in a good shape and, you know, live a fruitful, healthful life. Uh, it's challenging. And for other people that are trying to endeavor into things, please more, what, how, how was your, what did you do? What was the things that made you be able to, cause I know you're working like 80, 90 hours a week back in the day. Yes. What was it that you were able to, how did you accomplish your goals? I guess is my question. I'm sorry. I'm stuttering. No problem. You just put it out there. You just put it out there. Here's what I do know. Uh, I was a big fan of Tony Robbins a long time ago. And uh, as much as I hated Tony Robbins, I saw the infomercials, like who would be stupid enough to, to go to a Tony Robbins seminar? Well, I saw people getting success. So I ended up going and uh, he was pretty impressive. And he talked about taking massive action. Put your mind towards something and take massive action. Okay, so he talked about this RPM method. So it's R is, what's the reason? What, sorry, what are the results you want? The P is, what is the purpose of those results? And then the M is, the take the massive action, write a massive action plan. So uh, when I was working 30 hours of fitness coaching, 35 hours of school teaching, I decided I'm going to write a book. I called my buddy, a motivational speaker. I said, CJ, how long does it take you to write a book? He goes, for me, 40 days. For you, it'll probably take you six months. And that was October 28, October 29. I said, I'll get it done by January 1st. It'll be published and on a shelf. Massive action. I will figure out a way. So what is the result I wanted? I wanted the book. What's the purpose? I want to inspire men everywhere. The Ultimate Men's Playbook is the book I wrote. 312 pages. The graphics look amazing. It's a good book. Um, and I just said, I'm going to do it. Somehow, during lunch hours, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to devote my time to this, regardless of the fact that I have no time. Because this is important. I got it done. It's the same thing as moving to Costa Rica in short order and selling everything. Massive action. You want anything in life? What's the results you want? What's the purpose of those results? Like the deep desire? And then just write down your list and just execute. Chris, amazing thing happened. Amazing things happen. So TikTok, somebody said TikTok's the thing you got to get on to. I saw Clark Bartram. Do you know Clark Bartram? I know the name, yes. Okay, he's on every single uh, muscle magazine along with uh, Mike O'Hearn. Um, real cover boy, good guy. He got on a, on a TikTok and exploded. So I figured, okay, I'm going to give TikTok a try. I'm going to put my word out there. I remember my first post, I had hardly an interest, but I was committed to it. And I said, I'm going to put out whatever it takes to get noticed. And somebody, my second post said, you're going to be famous one day. Just want to let you know. I'm the first to observe that you're going to get noticed. So if you look at one of my early posts, somebody commented It was like one person commented. And then it was like 200 posts later, no traction, Chris, most people would give up. I'm stubborn. I said, I'm just going to do this anyway. Somebody's going to resonate, resonate with this. If it's one person, it's worth it. And all of a sudden, one of them went viral, a 1.2 million. Another one went 1 million. And now all of a sudden I'm getting calls from people saying, can you coach me? Was it worth it? Absolutely. What people do, though, is, well, I'm not quite like The Rock. I'm not quite like uh, Chris Bumstead. Who are you? You're a small, natural guy. You're 52 years old. You look like The Rock's dad. You're old. I don't <laughs> care. I don't care. There's no imposter syndrome here. I am who I am. I add value, and no one's going to work harder for you than me, period. And I'm genuine. And that's it. Like, I'm the real deal because I believe it. And the people who I work with know it too, right? So you say, screw it. Yeah, maybe I'm not enough, but who cares? This is the best I've got. I'm going to put myself out there anyway. And if people want to joke, criticize, critique, great. I don't care. 
Outstanding. Well, I think the funny thing you said was, you know, people talking about how you're smaller. It's like, well, that's a hell of a lot more attainable at 52, 48 years old than the rock. So perhaps I want to train with somebody that has a physique that I know I could attain as opposed to the rock, Chris Bumstead, Michael Hearn, some of these other guys. It's like, well, right. Yeah. No kidding. I might be smaller, but this is what you can get. So I think that's yeah. uh, seems a lot more realistic in my opinion to, to go that route. Oh, you know very much mean? so. Very much so. And the thing too, Chris, when you take a look at a natural guy who's lean, I look at a guy like Philip Ricardo and Philip Ricardo could wear a shirt that's maybe a little bit baggy. Right. And you see him prior to competition, you see the drawn in face and you're like, this guy's a nobody. Mm -hmm. And then he takes off his shirt and you're like, oh, he's got something there. And then he pumps up. And the moment he pumps up, everything comes to life. And he looks like he's 200 pounds on stage when, in fact, he's probably 178, 180. He looks 20 pounds bigger. I competed at one, um, I think it was 187 um, at one of my contests. And I looked huge. The next day, I looked tiny. I looked small. It was like a night and day difference. When you do everything right and you carb load and you pump up, you're a completely different beast. So what you see right now, okay, it is what it is. But if I were to pump up, it'd be a completely different perception, right? People don't take that into account. And it's also um, like if you watched <laughs> uh, like Natty for, or Natty for Life, the Generation I or Four, and they had the comparative uh, physiques. And mostly it was Philip Ricardo against some of the other bigger guys on the side-by-side. I'm sorry, it just seems a lot more aesthetically pleasing to see an athletic build than the overgrown, massive guys out there. Just And it just looks, you can tell that it's a lot more healthy. And yeah, when I put on my shirt, I just look like just some regular athletic guy. Right now, I take off my shirt. You can be like, hey, put your dad, by the way. But, you know, <laughs> during, you know, contest prep and things like that. Yeah, 160, 165 pounds. And you just, it's a lot more healthful and uh, definitely easy, easily to be attained. Um, and in addition to that, uh, well, yeah, you were talking about Philip and some of these other guys, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's like, when you see that and you see the beauty in that, it almost seems like there's the, there's no other reason why you would want to go the route. Um, and I guess, unless you're just trying to be one of the freaks in the room, you know what I mean? And then, so being that you have been training for so long, what was the biggest motivator to stay natural? Oh, man. I think it's longevity. I knew this. There was a guy who, um, I, I, was a, I was an insecure person in my early 20s. I would see somebody who was on roids, who mm -hmm. was bigger than me, and I know how much effort I put in. Mm -hmm. And to see that guy go from a very average person to somebody completely outstanding in a very short period of time, I'm like, I'm jealous. It bothers me because I will never do drugs. Right. But to see him succeed, I remember watching him bench press 315 just like I did. I go, okay, so what? I can do 315 too. And my buddy goes, you didn't see the other first nine reps. He just completed 10. I'm like, ah, damn. Now right. I feel really bad, right? And I remember seeing, he looked amazing. I remember seeing him six months later off of the juice. And I'm like, that's the same guy? He looks tiny. So does that mean that I've got to take steroids? The moment I start, I've got to take it forever? No, thanks. I'm going to pass on that. I'm a cheapo. I'm not spending my money money on that kind of stuff. I'd rather buy a motorcycle, but invest the, in the stock market, buy a nice home, and then rely on that when, in fact, a natural body to its full extent looks a lot better. So I just said, no, I'm not doing this. I think I could achieve my perfection, my best physique, and that's got to be good enough. Amen. I like that. So I see in the background you've got the very <laughs> itemized looks like a schedule. Um, so for many people, time is a for even myself, time is definitely one of those things that is very hard to manage. So for men that are men and women who are endeavoring to take charge of their life, get fit. One of the biggest things they always say is they have a problem with time. I know there's that Arnold Schwarzenegger video, everyone has a problem with time, but the 24 hours we sleep six, yada yada yada. What's your advice for people? time management to make sure that they can finally get healthy. Okay. Oh, finally get healthy. Yeah. 
Okay. Or, well, uh, people that need people that are trying to like their New Year's resolution. Hey, I want to get fit, and then within about two weeks, they're already saying, "Oh my gosh, I don't have the time." Okay, I'm just gonna give you. I'm gonna try to make it one minute long. That that uh, board back there is my son's. Oh, okay. He's in town for three weeks. He's visiting for three weeks. Okay, gotcha. that's his game plan. So here's a kid who went from zero dollars in 2020. Mm -hmm. He got out of uh, university, just decided I'm done with my uh, my scholarship. I'm done. I don't want to do this. And he went from zero to eight thousand dollars a month with his business. Massive action. Okay. That board right there was the plan to go from eight thousand a month to thirty thousand dollars a month as a twenty two year old kid. Okay, kids making thirty forty thousand dollars a month because he wrote down what he wanted. There's a purpose behind it. And here's your action plan. And no matter what, I'm going to follow through on the plan. So my advice to a listener who wants to get into shape, there's only five things you need to do. Number well, aside from the five things, the five executable things, you need to set a reason for why you want to do this. So what do you want to achieve aesthetically? What do you want to look like? How do you want to feel? Why is that important to you? And like really nail that down. If you've got a significant other, tell her, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to get into peak shape. And here's why. I want to be the object of your desire. I want to feel good. I want to be there for my kids. I want to be a pillar of strength. That's the first step. Number two is make the decision once that no matter what, you're going to follow through. Chris, a couple of days ago, I was under the weather like actually really not feeling well at all. And my wife says, are you going to work out? And I said, you know, I'm going to work out. It's a non-negotiable. It might not be a great workout, but I'm working out. I don't care how sick I am. I had COVID as I've still worked out during COVID. Right. Did not full capacity is more like 30% capacity, but I made that promise to myself that I'm not going to budge. So step number one is if you already have the know-how, because there's tons on the internet, you could figure it out or you can get a coach or you can talk to somebody. Like I know somebody could come to you, Chris, and you've got tons of wisdom and advice and you can steer them in the right direction, either for money or not. And I can do the same too, right? I would look at somebody, I would get them onto Mifflin Gior. There's a formula online. I would type in my age, uh, male, age 52. Here's my body weight. Here's my activity levels. Here's my height. And it's going to tell you, this is the amount of calories you need. If you, you know, if you exercise, you need this much. So it breaks it down to something like, unfortunately, my metabolism is not great. I need 2,600. That's what I need to maintain, right? If I want to get lean, it's going to be a little less. That's my calorie totals. That's where you start first. Next thing is you make a food template, two or three breakfasts, two or three lunches, two or three dinners. You have a special Saturday where you can eat whatever you want just, just to break through uh, the monotony, have a couple snacks. That's your template. You put it on the fridge. You've got your game plan. You decide that you're going to have your template for exercise. For me, it's two times a week. So figure out the routine that you're going to stick with no matter what that's scientifically sound that's going to get you the results. From there, drink your eight to 10 glasses of water, get your six to eight hours of sleep, going to bed at a regular time, waking up at a regular time, and expose yourself to positives. Get rid of the news, get rid of mainstream media, listen to podcasts, listen to guys. I like Joe Rogan. I like some of the stuff on TikTok from some influencers that are pretty cool that I can resonate with. Brainwash yourself of all the junk that's out there and put positive in people saying you can do it. You can do it. David Goggins, man. Like when I hear David Goggins, I'm forced to do what I need to do because he's doing a lot more than I am. Right. So there's your template of five things that you do daily based on your promise to yourself, based on the goals that you have. And you say, no matter what I'm committed, that's your formula. Anyone can do it. And then what you do is you make a public commitment and you get accountable to somebody, somebody you respect and trust that if I didn't follow through, he would look down on me because that would kill me. If I had a coach who I deeply respected and I didn't follow through, he's like, he sees me as a phony. That's it. That's your formula. That is amazing. Tom, I've learned a lot in just these 40 some odd minutes we've been talking. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, my pleasure, man. So, uh, 
you were talking about the different things. Where can people, because obviously, I mean, people need to follow you. I mean, just in these, I've learned a lot in just these like 45 minutes we've been talking. And that's not blowing smoke. I mean, I'm, you, you've rejuvenated some of the things I needed to hear, especially the negativity. Get away from the news, folks. Everything sucks. Just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, that's that's probably the biggest takeaway from, I mean, not the biggest, that's definitely a great takeaway. Get away from the news. Um, where can people learn more about you and where can they follow you? Okay, so uh, if you type in ultimatemensplaybook.com, uh, that's my website. You see my book there. I don't care if you buy my book or not. If somebody asked me, can I have your book? I'd probably send it to them. I don't really care, right? So that's an incentive to take a look at the website, ultimatemensplaybook.com. Um, email coach Tom Kayat. So it's K-I-A-T at gmail.com. Uh, I've got a TikTok page. I think it's at Tom Kayat. I think it's so many posts there. It's unbelievable. And then it's got, it's got some links as well, right? And here's the thing, Chris, I'm, I don't need to make money. I'm retired. I'm done. I've got a passive income at this point. I can do whatever the heck I want. Um, one guy reached out to me, says, do you think I could have a Zoom call with you just to chat with you? Yeah, no problem. 20 minutes, no skin off my back, right? And I think it's important for men to support other men. Yes. And just, you know, give encouragement. If you're ever down on your luck, you ever want some motivation, you ever need some advice, you can always reach out to me. I'm not going to sell you anything. I don't care. You want to work with me for, for your reasons and you need that accountability, I'm here for you. If you want to just chit chat for 20, 30 minutes, free of cost, I don't really care. I might say no, because I might be busy. Sure. But I think as, uh, as human beings, we need to do that. That's how you can reach out to me. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I will be buying your book shortly after this video is over because that's- I'll I, send it to you. Dude, I'll send it to you. Uh, you, you don't, don't need it. to buy the book. I appreciate that, but I'll send it to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Tom, it has been a pleasure. And anytime, uh, let's do this again. This was really awesome. Um, folks, again, check them out. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name earlier, Tom. That was good, man. It's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, the reality is it's Kiatipis. It's a Greek name. No one gets that. So Tom Kaya, Tom Kiat, I don't really care. I was known as Mr. K as a school teacher. So whatever. Gotcha. Oh, I mean, am I, uh, I can't pronounce many uh, Greek names at all. My, <laughs> my brother-in-law's yeah. last name is Apostolus. And for the longest time, I called him Snuffleuf. It's just a, just a <laughs> yeah. so, it was good stuff. What have been some of the, uh, before we go, what have been some of the cultural, uh, for people thinking of moving to Costa Rica? I know this is completely off topic from bodybuilding. What have been some of like the cultural shocks you had moving down there? Man, things are chilled out here. Really? It's, they, they call it Pura Vida, pure life. Sure. You are, it changes you. If you think you're going to come to Costa Rica and change Costa Rica, no, no, no. You just got to embrace it. When you've, when you're living in the sun, you got the heat, you got people saying good morning to you every single day, walking down the street. It's a carefree attitude. People are hustling and bustling here. There's no entitlement. You walk down the street and you see doors wide open, uh, window, there's no windows in some of these houses. You're like, shoot, man, like these people have poverty. You don't know how good you have it back home. And then you see some of these, I'm looking at some houses on the hill here, like Beverly Hills mansions, looking at a house right now, 7,000 square feet, it's a huge house. And then you're kind of reaching for that brass ring, right? Like, oh yeah. So you see the poverty and you see the success and you're inspired by one and you're humble by the other. That's Costa Rica, man. You're just in total nature. Highly recommend people come for a visit experience. But if you're ever thinking of moving, hey, North America is great, but there's other places in the world that are unbelievable. Outstanding. Hence the move. All right. Well, maybe I'll have to look up some retirement options here in a little bit. So You're free like to come it. down, man, and uh, stay at my place if you want. Sounds bueno. I like it. I like it. <laughs> right on. All, right. All right, my man. Thank you so much. And we will talk again soon. Guys, be sure to check out my friend, uh, Tom Kiat, and God bless you, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, bro. Take care. Take care.